So Dr. Charu Uppal is a senior lecturer at Karlstad University, Sweden, and has a PhD in media studies from Pennsylvania State University. She has also taught at various universities in the United States and, and the University of South Pacific in Fiji. Her research in interests include the representation and formation of cultural identity in the developing world, in the global era, and the role of media and technology in mobilizing citizens towards political and cultural activism. Thanks, Charlene, for that. Um, you know, I think uh, Dr. Sharda and I were probably telepathically communicating because a lot of the stuff that she has said, I'm going to start to show you in a video. What, what, what dare I say about aesthetics in a world so, so far away from us in time and place? Well, what I like to do in cases like this is in, instead of going to dictionaries and looking up aesthetics and then trying to triangulate with some Indian and Greek or other text, is to just pull something off the shelf and see what people do with the concept. What do people do with the concept of aesthetics? And if you look at something like the Oxford Book of blah, blah, I forget the actual title, readings and aesthetics. Here are some of the things they do. They ask questions. They ask a range of questions under the large category of aesthetics. That's their, what is it? The Oxford Book of Aesthetics, I think it's called, or readings and aesthetics. What are the readings and questions that are adduced to illuminate this category of aesthetics? First question is why identify anything as art? What do artists do? Can we ever understand an artwork? How can we evaluate art? Those are the first four categories of the Oxford Reader in Aesthetics, and none of those categories apply to India at all. Part of the reason is that India had no unified domain that we can, by any intertranslatable word, call art. No unified domain, no singular concept that brought together everything that we would throw into that pot. Painting, music, uh, expressive literature, forms of, of architecture, whatever may be in your, in your head that would go into that domain of art. For such a domain, we have, we have perfectly well, we have, cat, we have, we have contents of that sort in South Asia. We have no unified category, so Indians never sat around and asked the question, why identify anything as art? Because art was not a useful concept. It's not a pertinent concept. There was no totalized vision of art. What do artists do? Again, can we, understand, can we even understand an artwork? I mean, there were forms of analysis that were developed to make sense of given works. But the robust philosophical question, is it possible to understand a work of art, was never asked in precisely those terms. What is artistic genius? What is creativity? That's the fifth, fourth or fifth question. Indians thought to some degree about creativity, pratibha, and uh, cognate terms. But again, there is no robust theory of what constitutes, what constitutes creative imagination. I mean, we have lots of terms for beauty. My, my own teacher wrote 
wrote an article when he was younger called Terms for Beauty in Sanskrit Literature, and the most beautiful of the beautiful terms is Saundarya. We've got lots of terms for beauty, but beauty as a category was never exposed to the consistent, coherent, sustained analysis. Beauty itself wasn't. So we're getting, it's getting clearer and clearer that the idea of this aesthetic may not be pertinent. But there are two other questions, there are two other questions that are significant. Why describe anything as aesthetic? This is the fifth of the Oxford readers' questions. And why respond emotionally to art? Why describe anything as aesthetic and why respond emotionally to art? These are two questions where a pronounced overlap with what happens in South Asia can be noticed. It's a terrible experience seeing the death of a male bird while the pair of birds is mating, and he experiences a, in a, in a moment of aesthetic transformation. This text is probably from around the period of Ashoka, 250 to 200, 150, somewhere in that area, somewhere in that area. Of course, I'm alone on the planet and dating it that late, but I'm right. Talk about lost in translation. I had actually done this in, pa, uh, in Mac and with some really wonderful um, uh, special effects, which I'm sorry you will not be able to see. Um, so what I do when I, when I encounter uh, someone like Sheldon Pollock, who has enormous amount of work, and I have very little, almost negligible knowledge of Indology, I come from media studies, is to read some of his work, and then I get overwhelmed because I'm afraid that I'm not secure enough to question it, and then I try to understand it from what I know. And Rasa has always been very interesting to me because of coming from media's uh, perspective, you know. And media effect is a huge amount of research area where people actually study the impact of audiovisual images uh, or audiovisual uh, um, content on people. Um, so I'm going to, you know, some of it has been talked, so I'm going to quickly skip over some of the um, things that are common, go very quickly over that, and that is that um, Pollock has certain tools in his bag, and one of them is desacralization, then he takes it out of context. The other one is actually uh, looking at it through his theories. And a theory on a camera is like a lens. If you see, if you put a blue filter, you see everything blue. So he has his theories that come from Marxism, and therefore he uses that. And uh, at some point, I think it does seem like you know he has certain kind of an agenda. Um, and he also uses authorship and copyright a lot um, to uh, to establish his theories, which again, uh, as we've heard in last lecture, that uh, you can't say that about Natya Shastra. It's a very old text. Whatever is remaining is said to be only a portion of what was in the original. Uh, it was uh, 12,000 verses reduced to 6,000 verses by Bharat Muni, so it may ha he may, may have been one of the many authors, and we don't have everything uh, uh, consolidated. But he actually ignores all of that and ignores the fact that Natya Shastra, the fifth Veda, you know, to question, if you were to question his own Marxist theories, the fifth Veda made play possible for all caste and creeds. They removed that any division between people, so he doesn't want to acknowledge that. Now it is important when he desacralizes everything to acknowledge that actually European drama that had origin in Greek drama uh, was originally sacred as well, like the Indian drama. And we forget that because that has not been talked about when Christianity came about, uh, drama was not considered uh, holy and it, uh, it was only associated with church, so it was banned for some time, but when it was revived, it was revived in the context of Christianity. And so a lot of symbolism, dance, music, and the concept of sacred was taken away. So actually, it was taken away at a later time, but in, or in original time, drama was both a ritual and a prayer. And there was always an understanding that the drama is done both for people and gods. There's an invisible entity there that you're pleasing. Um, and uh, Bharat Gupta talks about that a lot. He also says that you know, in, in this, this way of looking at things, when we see that a ritual turns into a myth and then myth, myth turns into a drama a performance, he says that actually is a very linear Darwinian way of looking at it, because sometimes rituals turn into uh, a myth and, or an entertainment and vice versa. And he gives example of Garba dance, which used to be a ritual, but is used as entertainment today, and Tej, which used to be actually for entertainment, but is actually a ritual celebration. Today. 
So uh, there's also debate about evolution of Indian drama because it's such an old treatise. Um, and because um, you know there's no uh, direct uh, understanding of where the drama originated, people have tried to guess about where Dasa Rupaka has come from, and which is the 10 genres of acting. And they've tried to compare that to the, to the Greek system, forgetting completely that Natya Shastra precedes all Indian plays and therefore was written in a completely different way. So when uh, Pollock talks about the fact that it doesn't give m m uh, poetry, music, uh, any importance, uh, is he's wrong because it, a lot of it, Natya Shastra was written before. In fact, in that case, I think it's a genius uh, uh, piece of work. Um, so symbolism and uh, dance held a lot of pr uh, prominence in both Indian and Greek drama. Uh, but when uh, uh, European um, uh, Indologists came and they were influenced by the biases of the European theater, uh, they wanted to look for dialogue. And uh, they, they thought, okay, well, because the main uh, uh, conductor of the play is called Sutradhara, the first play must have been puppetry, which Bharat Gupta says is not really a clear, uh, uh, accurate analysis because Sutradhara might have come from the fact that um, uh, the main architect carried a thread to measure stage, which was con uh, created anew every time a stage, a theater was performed. And so the actual um, director was called Acharya. So to say that puppetry was the first theater form is also not correct. Coming to Rasa and Rasa theory. Now, what is Rasa? Uh, you know, we, we've heard that term so many times. Zindagi nira so gaya. It's without the color. Without rasa, we sometimes define as color. Sometimes we define as enjoyment. In terms of Bollywood, I would say pesa vasool is what the people say. Maza gaya, you know, that kind of thing. It lives in us, okay? Um, but, if, you know, I don't have the time to talk about it all. But when I was reading about this, I was amazed at the amazing detail of explaining what rasa is. So much so that actually I wrote to a friend in the U.S. who studies me effects to tell her that we should actually study this because this is um uh, you know, this is something that people have been talking about, but but here is uh, uh, a document that actually tells you uh, what is going on in that fleeting moment uh, and make that fleeting moment so so big by actually analyzing it. So bhavas, we all know, so bhavas are emotions or feeling, but actually it's sensation itself. And it's combination of bhavas that creates the rasa. Rasa is the ultimate effect, even though there are 10, but it's the final one, the sthyayi bhava. And it's produced by mixing of various bhavas, right? But bhavas don't create the rasa. Now, in the previous presentation, you know, we, we heard that, you know, um, uh, Pollock is critiquing, you know, rasa seen to rasa heard. You know, where does rasa, rasa exist? It cannot be located. It cannot be located, just like if you were studying yoga sutras, the chakras cannot be located, but we know the energy centers. You cannot find them on operating table. It cannot, yet you need a body and consciousness for it. You need, and it is, it is based on prior experience. It is definitely evoked by what you watch, which is the stimulus, but it is based on memory and knowledge. And when I was reading that, I thought, ah, I'm a teacher, I know exactly what he's talking about. Because I can give the same lecture, and somebody could get an A, and somebody could get a D, and actually blame it all on me, right? But, but its important aspect is memory and knowledge in that is aspect. Um, the experience of rasa is the experience of waking up. It always existed. So that's something else that Pollock has a problem with. He says, you know, how can it always exist? Because he's questioning universal experience. And rasa is not just ex universal. It is both universal and subjective at the same time. It is an experience that can be had, and it's subjective dependent on your memory, your pre previous experience and knowledge. And one other example that I would give from my own experience is I had no understanding of classical music whatsoever, Western classical music very little. When I was writing, I would listen to NPR National Public Radio, and I would listen to about four to five hours of classical music interspersed with documentaries on what they were about. By the end of a year, I was buying classical music because my taste had been developed, and I actually understood it. Before that, my understanding of it was very crude, and that can be developed, and, and I actually seek it now. So that is also important. Okay, so rasa is a universal experience and it cannot be located or created, but must surface from the vast ocean of human consciousness due to a confluence of several factors. Okay, it's quite a simple concept. 
but it's actually been complicated because they want to study it. Now, where does, where, what's the origin? We're talking about the various masalas. Remember the masala films, combining of all the, all the emotions? You, you cannot locate, suppose you're, you're eating, you know, you're drinking, eating rasam, you know, you can't locate the spices in there, but it's a complete experience. It's the unity of that experience. It is not in the dish. It is not in the person. But it's somewhere in between when the person has just had the dish, experienced it, that fleeting moment when they acknowledge having tasted something, right before they say, wow, what a great meal. It's that fleeting moment that is rasa. I think all of us have experienced it. Now, what was interesting to me was that there's some scholars that have actually questioned what Pollock has said and actually looked at rasa as a conscious state as a state that can be measured and associated with cognitive theory. Uh, that actually when you experience it, your body temperature changes, the color of your skin changes, your uh, facial expression changes, all of that today actually can be measured. They do th some of that in media effects anyway. So I would suggest if somebody is interested, I think that's, that's a field of study to go to. Um, these are all various uh, ra um, bhavas that create the rasa. And Pollock had a problem with, you know, he said, well, rudra, because uh, some people had defined rudra as horror. Some had defined it anger. And he said, why, why is an anger there? At some point, he had brought up the concept of motherly love. But we know motherly love is a lot of emotions. It can come in anger, it can come in, in affection, it can also come in chiding someone, and it can also come in Bollywood style of singing a, you know, a lullaby to the child, right? So it's, a, you know, because he's nitpicking that and, and not realizing that actually um, it's a process. Consciousness is a process, it's not a thing. Um, now, there are some other scholars uh, who have actually questioned um, um, you know, this universality of uh, rasa, and they're saying, well, it cannot be a universal concept. It must be culture-bound, since most of the Natya Shastra is taken up with describing particular theatrical and dramatic arrangements of elements to stimulate particular rasa experience. Um, and the resulting Sanskrit play and its performance consequently are wholly different in the kind form, uh, say, a uh, Greek tragedy. But the same scholars, I don't have that uh, quote here because of the space, uh, the same scholars at some point also say that they're sort of comparing that to the same emotions that you get from a soap opera as opposed to a refined play. And, and they say that that actually should be acknowledged, that what Rasa is talking about is a refined experience because it's also based on knowledge and based on your memory and experience. Um, Bharat, Professor Gupt actually uh, compares rasa to catharsis. He says the closest thing that you get in Western uh, concept of uh, art and aesthetics is catharsis. And he says, regarded as restoration to a state of pleasure, not generally experienced, while the process of rasa emergence requires the removal of obstructions. Catharsis and rasa, with the separate points of emphasis, both begin with purification and end in delight. I think we've all uh, experienced that at some point. Uh, is rasa an archaic concept? I talked about it briefly. Uh, Mason, uh, David Mason says he's using cognitive theory. And he says that rasa and aesthetics have nothing in common, should not be compared. He actually critiques R Richard Schechner's theory of rasa aesthetics, which is a recent thing they've come up with. Uh, and he says they have nothing in common. There's no need to bring Charu, would you like would you like to conclude and take some questions? OK. One question. Uh, my question to you is that can you also explain a bit about how to become the Rasika? Is there anything in particular which you would like to? Yes, actually that was another slide where Bharat Muni talks about very interesting. He talks about if you have to be first interested in the drama and the story. Um, you cannot accompany just your friend. Will be children, maybe children. Nay, that's you have to actually be really interested in the play. Uh, you have to have some knowledge of music, drama, and dance because if you don't, then you would your experience wouldn't be there. One of the other things he says is you have to have an open mind. Maybe there's some new concept that might come in that you can learn. Something I found fascinating was you cannot be inebriated. You cannot be under the influence of alcohol. You cannot take a six pack of beer and go to a live concert and say, yay, because you're supposed to get drunk on music and performance. <laughs>